Please join me in welcoming the director of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library, Jay Hakes, and former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. night for the presidential libraries. Uh, you may have heard that the uh, Reagan Library is having an event tonight, uh, but, uh, but uh, we, we've got a tremendous event here, which I think you will really enjoy and find a, a very memorable event. Uh, this event uh, is uh, helped by the sponsorship of the Georgia Center for the Book, and uh, we also the World Affairs Council. Uh, World Affairs Council is Wayne Lord in the audience, just wave. and. Uh, Coca-Cola Company has also been very helpful in making this event happen. And we thank all of you for uh, showing up. Our guest tonight uh, needs no introduction. She was the first uh, woman to head the Department of State. Uh, historians, when they review that record, are going to find uh, many, many momentous uh, accomplishments. And uh, we also have someone who's a great communicator. Uh, we have many celebrities in the audience, uh, many of the diplomatic corps. But uh, you have to be related to Jimmy Carter to get introduced. So uh, <laughs> we have Chip Carter and Becky Carter are with us tonight. And former First Lady of the United States, uh, Rosalind Carter, is with us tonight. Can you? <laughs> if your name is on the building, you can't kind of sneak in and not be noticed. Uh, that we're going to use a question and answer format. Um, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, the, we had the History Day winners this morning asking excellent questions. I don't know if I can do as good a job. But we're then going to call on you to ask questions as well. And we will have to finish up right on time to uh, meet uh, travel connections. So Secretary Albright, uh, welcome to the Jimmy Carter Library. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, thank you for telling everybody who I am, because not everybody always knows. Um, <laughs> but I would. Thank you very much, uh, my dear friend Rosalind, for coming down. Really appreciate it. And Chip and Becky, thank you. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I was coming back from China not long ago, and Chicago was the first port of entry. And I was there getting undressed for the security people. <laughs> and uh, I, I put my stuff down on the conveyor belt. And the lady ahead of me said, so where'd you get all those screw top bottles? My bottles all leak. And I said, well, I got them at the container store. And then I was going through the magnetometer, and the TSA guard looked at me, and he said, oh my god, it's you. Uh, he said, I'm from Bosnia, and we all love you in Bosnia, and if it weren't for you, there wouldn't be a Bosnia, and you're always welcome in Bosnia, and can I have my picture taken with you? So we stopped the whole line. We have our picture taken, and I go back to get my stuff, and the lady of the screw top bottle says, so what exactly happened here? And um, I said, well, I used to be Secretary of State, and she said, of Bosnia? So, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> now, uh, somewhere, uh, some people here tonight may not know that you started your career in the executive branch of government in the Carter administration, working for the National Security Council. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got that job and, and what you did? Uh, well, um, I love doing it. I had um, uh, been a student of Zbigniew Brzezinski's at, at Columbia. And I, at the time, was working for Senator Ed Muskie uh, of Maine. And what happened was Dr. Brzezinski called me up and said, would I, he had first called me to announce the fact. He calls me just after he was named. And he said, you know, Madeline, I've just been named National Security Advisor. And I said, yeah, I, I heard that. Um, and he said, can you find me a place to live? And I said, geez, big, I thought you were calling to offer me a job. And he said, no, I'm calling you to ask me <laughs> to find a place to live. So what happened in March of 78, he did um, ask me to come and work at the National Security Council staff. And my job was to do congressional relations. And so I had the 
honor and sometimes the difficulty of sitting in on every meeting that President Carter had with members of Congress. And so it gave me the opportunity, um, as somebody said, to know less about more subjects than anybody else in the national security, <laughs> because I had to understand what all the issues were that we were doing. Uh, and try to figure out how to get the administration in a coher coordinated and coherent way to present them to Congress. And it was great, I loved it. And I, I loved learning about how the National Security Council system worked. I loved working for Dr. Brzezinski. He, uh, I think, was a, was a fantastic boss. Um, and the lesson out of it is to be nice to your professors. <laughs> <laughs> of which you are now one. Of uh, which I am now one, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, so you were uh, working with the Congress a lot. Uh, there must have been some colorful characters there. Uh, are there any stories you can tell us well, about were, Congress that we uh, maybe uh, uh, hadn't been told before? Well, there were a, quite a few colorful characters. One of the things that was interesting was, as I said, I'd worked on the Hill for Ed Muskie at the beginning of the discussions about the Panama Canal Treaty. And um, so I was able to see it from one side, and then I came to the White House at the time that the treaty was being voted on. And it was a very tough uh, uh, concept for people to understand. People uh, blamed Jimmy Carter for giving away the Panama Canal, um, which I believe was one of the really big forward-looking steps in terms of our whole relationship with uh, Latin America. But I think the hard part was that, um, you know, there were some amazing people there that are out of a different era. Howard Baker, who in fact made it, he's the one that made it happen in many ways as the leader, the Republicans, of being able to develop some coordinated approach. And Robert Byrd, who was not easy to deal with despite the fact that he was the same party. Um, but the main thing that was the problem was that they would come to the White House and my job was to figure out what they wanted to eat, what they would say. Um, and they were, some of them were, were more than difficult. But on the bottom line is I think President Carter uh, managed to really work with them. What I think was really, I don't know whether you would agree with this, Mrs. Carter, but he would say to members of Congress, I understand, which did not mean I agree. So I had to <laughs> keep telling him. They said, but the president said, and I said, I'm sorry, he understood what you had to say. <laughs> he didn't necessarily agree with it. But one of my first meetings, I'll never forget, I kind of entered the government fairly high at a, laterally and didn't understand a lot of the rules. And, one of my first meetings was in the cabinet room when the president was talking about the Middle East arms package. It was the first time that we had quite a large package to, to sell. And so there were the members of Congress that were there that had to deal with it, Senator Javits and a, a variety of members of Congress. And I knew that my job was to take notes on what it is that the members of Congress said and what questions they asked so that I could figure out responses to them. And I did all that, and I was sitting in back, and I go back to my office, which was down in the basement of the White House near what is known as the Situation Room, and I had a direct line. Dr. Brzezinski was upstairs, and all of a sudden I get a phone call, and he says, Madeline, would you please come up and read your notes to Secretary Vance and Secretary Brown? And I kind of looked down at these notes, and they looked chicken scratches, and, and I, I had only been there like three days. And I get up there, and they say, how did President Carter get from this point to the next. And I thought, you guys were all there, you know. Uh, <laughs> and so I kind of look at it all, and I, I finally said, I'm sorry, I didn't write that down. So I go back to my office, and I thought, OK, it's all over. I just got this job. And then I decided that the best defense was a strong offense. So I march back upstairs, and I say, Dr. Brzezinski, I didn't think I was hired as a secretary. And he said, you weren't. And I said, well, I don't take, or, you know, I don't do Stenon. And he said, let me just tell you something. Uh, it's the usual custom that the junior member in the room takes the notes. Did you look around? You clearly were the junior member, so <laughs> figure out how to do it. So that was my introduction. I thought I had lost the job before I ever started. And then I thought, well, why didn't they just record everything? Then I realized that other presidents had recorded everything. <laughs> <laughs> but not the one that we were. <laughs> Now, one theme through uh, your career has been the ability to communicate clearly um, and uh, to presidential candidates and presidents who tend to be busy people, you've had the knack of being able to develop uh, 
three-page memo that would crystallize some very complex issue. And uh, really, in, when you see how government works, that's a very important skill. And I understand you told me yesterday that you're actually teaching this to your students at Georgetown. Yeah. I, probably we have a lot of people here who would like to learn how to do that. Could you give us some guidelines? Well, on it's interesting because one of the things that I um, learned very quickly is nobody in the government reads 35-page papers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the quest and they are busy and they deal with an awful lot of issues And so the question is how in fact you're able to summarize things in a way that is useful for the principal the person that you're writing for and So I think that there really is a way that you can be very spare with words and realize that I hate to say this since we're both academics and there's some academics in the room you don't need a lot of subordinate clauses and participles and a variety of, of uh, punctuation that nobody understands. Um, and so I think the issue is really how to, to um, distill what you're going to do. And I have developed a form uh, that I found useful both in writing the memos and in getting them, is how you state what the subject is, the issue for decision, what the arguments are for and, uh, for and against, and then what I always find very important is for people to know what arguments, how they're going to have to defend the arguments that they've made, what is out there against what they want. What I tell my students, and I play president in this, is that if I want you to write upside down, that's what you're going to do. The format is what I say the format is, uh, because every principal likes to have a format that they like. Now, President Carter liked to have a lot of his things on light green paper. He also corrected your spelling. <laughs> um, and so if you got a memo back from the president with the spelling corrected, it was a little bit embarrassing. And so I, I make that point clear to my students. And I do talk a lot about what it was like to work for President Carter and President Clinton. It's a lot of fun. So, But I do think that writing, you don't, it, it, it's an art to write briefly, and it's very important because it's the only way that it gets read. Um, and to make very clear what the decision is that has to be made. Mm -hmm. Now, at uh, the United Nations, uh, one of your uh, leading efforts was to put pressure on uh, the Qaddafi government in Libya. That's a uh, name that's been in the news recently. Uh, so you, you've been following uh, that area for a long time. Um, what do you think about what's going on in Libya right now and the more general question of the uh, Arab Spring? Well, first of all, just a little bit of background on it. What happened when I got to the UN was not long after a Pan Am 103. And um, what was very difficult was that I met with the families of the victims of Pan Am 103. And my own daughter had been in England the year before and had come back around the same time. And so I just kind of really identified with the families. And um, the issue was, you know, how do you punish um, Libya for what it is that uh, they had done, who was responsible. Um, and so we kept the sanctions on Libya, and then the, one of the other things that I had to do was to uh, uh, make sure, one of the questions was the person that had been arrested and was at Lockerbie, uh, the question was how to transfer that person to The Hague for trial, so we, we dealt with that a lot. Um, I think that um, what has happened in Libya is remarkable and is very much a part of what is the great movement of our time, which is people wanting to have dignity, uh, to be able to make decisions about their own lives. And so I have um, for a long time said that when people say X people are not ready for democracy, I think that is uh, patronizing and wrong because my sense is that people are not ready for anything else. And so we are seeing the, the strength of that. Um, it's, however, a very complicated issue in Libya because um, in each of the countries of the Arab Spring, it's slightly different. What happened was that it began with the immolation of the man in Tunisia, and that issue spread virally, and the role of um, social media and everything has played a very big role in all of this. But in each of these countries, the situation is slightly different. And in Libya, what makes it different is that Gaddafi was sole dictator for 42 years, and there's very little structure uh, there in the country that is, allows the people to be able to make their voices heard. And so we are watching the fight, 
fighting part of it. And the question is how you move those that are known as rebels into a government that can actually govern, the governance issue. And so um, I think that the hard part is that I think we're all going to have to help. And there um, has been a, there have been a lot of questions as to whether we should be involved in nation building, uh, which is now a four-letter word. I happen to think that um, we all have experience in terms of how institutions work. The Carter Center has um, really been one of the leading advocates of trying to sort out how people govern themselves. And I think when it is requested by other countries, by those in the countries who want to set up a system that functions for their own people, then we should be able to respond to that. That's very different than imposing democracy. That's an oxymoron. And so I think that what is important is for us, whether it's private organizations or some public-private partnerships, to be able to help the Libyans, the Transitional Council, to be able to set up a system that works for them because Gaddafi destroyed everything. But the problem is that we, at the moment, unless something happened today, we don't know where Gaddafi is. A lot of the people that were quote, loyal to him, apparently have escaped across the borders. So I think it's, it's a complicated issue that we're going to have to keep our eye on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, Bosnia earlier, and uh, that has become uh, maybe almost a textbook case of a successful uh, intervention to achieve a humanitarian goal. And uh, Roger Cohn had an op-ed in the, or a column in the New York Times last week uh, saying, like many of my generation, I became an interventionist in Bosnia. Uh, and the point that he was making was that perhaps Vietnam created a bias against international uh, intervention by the United States, and Bosnia, because it was successful, maybe created a bias for intervention. And uh, this raises the question, uh, is there some obligation to intervene whenever there is a humanitarian crisis going on? And uh, you maybe have the best record of anybody of being able to sort out what sort of criteria should we have when we're going to commit American troops on foreign soil. Well, you, you've raised a lot of very interesting issues that um, I have spent a lot of time on, and if, if I can take a minute on it. Absolutely. What is interesting is every decision maker comes with his or her own baggage. And it was interesting during the Bosnia or the first uh, Clinton term, who brought what? So we had a lot of people that were um, had participated in some way in making decisions about Vietnam and were very concerned about the fact of never getting involved in anything again. I am um, a was a, lit a little bit older than everybody, um, and I was born in Czechoslovakia. And uh, my background is Munich, uh, of where decisions were made by people over the heads of the Czechoslovaks, and the country was dismembered. And um, if I may, I've got a new book that I'm working on, which is that period about the decisions that were made. And, so that was part of my background. The other part was that um, I would not be the one to make this argument, but one could say that Americans did not know what was going on during World War II in terms of the Holocaust. What happened in Bosnia was that we knew what was going on. There were pictures uh, on television practically every night of people again being put into railroad cars and being shipped somewhere and camps. and. Uh, starving people and barbed wire. And so the question was, should we do something about it? And it had come at a period right after the Gulf War, which we had won, and there was a sense, and if you remember, President Clinton's main uh, campaign was, it's the economy, stupid. I mean, um, and so the bottom line was, why would we get involved in anything abroad? And what happened was that I w was ambassador at the UN. I, as a result of that, met more different foreign diplomats than any other American diplomat. Whoever was ambassador to Germany would have met more Germans or whatever, but I saw everybody. And they would come up to me in Security Council meetings and say, why aren't you people doing something? Uh, people are being um, ethnically cleansed or um, raped or taken away in a variety of ways, and you are the United States. 
I would then come back and be a part of the principals' meetings. And, and I have to describe the scene fully. Uh, Colin Powell was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, a big, handsome man who had just won the Gulf War. He would come into meetings full of medals. <laughs> and I would be there as a mere mortal female <laughs> civilian um, saying, we've got to do something. And he's described this in his book, so I feel comfortable uh, describing it. And he, um, and, and the Pentagon is brilliant in briefings. They've got uh, 3D and, and various things and little red uh, pointers. And, and so <laughs> basically he would say, we can do this. We can really do this. It's a, the thing that we can do. We've got the best military in the world. But what are you going to say, I'll never forget this, to Sergeant Slepchak's mother uh, after he has died as a result of stepping on a landmine? Why were we there? So um, it was a real issue. It was very hard to argue as to what our national interest was in Bosnia. What happened was then General Powell left. General Shali Kashvili became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was somebody that had worked in Iraq on provide comfort and could understand what inter international institutions could do, that also we had some responsibility for each other. Um, and so we did something different. We actually bombed. We were able to get um, Bosnia free. And so what happened was Colin wrote his book, and somebody called me up and said, have you read Colin Powell's book? Do you know what he says about you? He said he had to patiently explain things to you. So I call him up and I say, Colin, you know, and he said, I did have to explain it to you patiently. You understood nothing. So uh, he, uh, and, and we are great friends. We go through this all the time. So, uh, so he sent me his book and he wrote, with love, admiration, et cetera, Madeline signed patiently, colon. So uh, I then sent back a note, and I said, love, admiration, et cetera, and I signed it forcefully, Madeline. Uh, so, but this is the discussion, is at what stage is um, our mass atrocities or, or genocide or um, various forms of ethnic cleansing part of US national interest? And one of the hard parts in teaching, which I do, is how you define national interest. And I do think that America's value system is part of our national interest. And when we see people being slaughtered, uh, then and we can be a part of an international way of res uh, responding to it, I think it's wise. I am now uh, part of a task force that is looking at a new concept called responsibility to protect. And it is the duty of a president of a country to protect the people, the territory, and the way of life. And if the president is not doing that, then the idea is that the international community has a responsibility to do it. But it is a very hard concept because it bumps right up against national sovereignty. Um, and countries do not want other countries coming in and telling them what to do. And I try to make the point it, and it usually gets across in the way, I happen to believe that the Bush administration did not do the right things in New Orleans. It did not work fast enough in order to protect the people. But supposing that the Chinese had decided to come in and say, you're not protecting your people. We are here to help you. Um, so it's a difficult concept, but it comes out of the idea that we now have information about what is happening everywhere. So do we have a responsibility within some international context to do something about it? How important is the multilateral approach to these interventions? Well, I think it's very important. Um, and it's always better to do it with others. I, I, have, I said earlier upstairs that people don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and ends in an ism. But um, <laughs> the bottom line is it's about partnership. The question is whether you can make it happen. And I find, um, as somebody that was at the UN, and I knew you could figure out how to make the system work. but. Uh, I am the person that's accused of having broken the rule over Kosovo, which was another uh, issue very similar to Bosnia. And it would have been nice to get a United Nations mandate, but we knew that the Russians were going to veto it. And so instead, we went to NATO. So it was multilateral in terms of being a NATO operation. But there are a lot of people who thought that Kosovo was illegal because we had not gotten a UN mandate. So I think it's better. Uh, multilateralism is just partnership. It's a matter of sharing the burden and the responsibility. So I think it's better to do it multilaterally. The statement was multilaterally if you can, unilaterally if you must. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, before we uh, turn it over to the audience, I'd like to discuss pins for a minute, if that's okay. Uh, we have uh, at the uh, Carter Museum for the next three months uh, an exhibit called Read My Pins. I, I think it's mistitled because uh, it's not what you think of for pins. Uh, someone suggested earlier tonight maybe they're brooches. Uh, I would call them colossal pieces of jewelry. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, but it's a stunning collection. I think it's about 200 pieces. Uh, it's shown all around. And uh, it's, it's hard to describe all of them, but I, I wonder if you could tell us sort of what were the importance of these pins in international uh, affairs and, and what some of your favorites Great. are. Great. Well, thank you. And I'm delighted that they're at the um, Carter Library because this is our seventh venue. Uh, the collection has now been seen by almost two million people. Um, and, um, and, it, and men, women, children um, have loved it. We've just come from New Orleans where the grunge element liked it too. Um, but we have, I've had a wonderful time uh, with it and it all started by accident. I clearly like jewelry, but um, what happened was that um, when I went to the UN in February 1993, it was right after the Gulf War and the ceasefire had been translated into a, a series of Security Council resolutions that were sanctions resolutions and the question was how you, we made sure that the sanctions would stay on. So I was an instructed ambassador and my instructions were to say perfectly terrible things about Saddam Hussein constantly, uh, which was fine, he deserved it, he had invaded Kuwait. So um, after a while a poem appeared in the papers in Baghdad comparing me to many things, but among them an unparalleled serpent. And I happened to have a snake pin, so I wore it when we were talking about Iraq. And, um, what happened was the ambassadors always after a Security Council meeting go out and talk to the press and all of a sudden the camera zeroed in on my pin and they said, why are you wearing that snake pin? I said, because Saddam Hussein called me an unparalleled serpent. And so I thought, well, this is fun. So I went out and <laughs> I actually bought a lot of costume jewelry and in order to, and I was the only woman on the Security Council and so I, I thought I'd have a little bit of fun. And, uh, I, um, so on good days, I wore butterflies and flowers and balloons, and on bad days, you know, all kinds of horrible insects and carnivorous animals. And uh, <laughs> the other ambassador would say, well, so what are we going to do today, or how do you feel? And the first President Bush had said, read my lips, no new taxes. So I said, read my pins. And that's how it started. And, uh, and I really did have fun with it. And the reason that I wanted to do the book, and the reason that I'm thrilled about the exhibit is that it provides a way to tell foreign policy stories. I, I clearly am a complete foreign policy wonk, and, um, but I think for a lot of people, foreign policy is very foreign, and the bottom line is it's very interesting, and it's a lot about human relations, and so um, they all provide some vehicle, and, and so I have several favorites. The sad part is I haven't had the pins now for a couple of years. <laughs> Um, and people have been very nice in giving me new pins. I just got one today that uh, was given to me. It's the skyline of Atlanta. Uh, but I call them my pity pins because people feel sorry for me that much. Um, but I have several that kind of tell uh, a good story. Um, I have a lot of Americana pins. I, I, I love to wear flags and eagles. And, um, and there's a pin that you'll see that is kind of a, uh, was made for me by the wife of the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Dick Myers, uh, of all the, the emblems of all of the services that we have. And so I would wear that when I was reviewing troops or doing military things. And then I have a, a dove that was given to me by Yitzhak's Rabin widow, um, Leah Rabin, who um, <clears throat> gave it to me before I was about to give a Middle East speech, and I wore it a lot. And then. Um, when I was in Jerusalem one time, and my room was another little box, and it had a necklace in it with a note saying it takes a lot of doves to make peace in the Middle East. Um, and, but two of my real favorites are, one is a heart, and it's, uh, I call it my youngest daughter, Katie, Katie's heart, and I have worn it every Valentine's Day except the last three. Um, and people say, well, how old is your daughter? And she's been 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. And she says, mom, you've got to tell people I made it when I was five. <laughs> so Katie's heart. 
And then one pin that's especially meaningful, and it's at the end of the book, and because the book is not a mystery story, I can tell you, it is a pin that I got uh, when I was in New Orleans, a couple of years after Katrina, and I had gone there in order to participate in something at the D-Day Museum, which is an amazing mm -hmm. museum in itself. And then afterwards, there was a dinner, and this young man comes up to me, and he says, my father is sitting over there. He's a World War II vet, and he earned two Purple Hearts, and the, the young man has a box in his hands, and he said, I have something I, I want to give you, um, and this is something that belonged to my mother that my father had made for her for their 60th wedding anniversary, but she died as a result of Katrina. And then he opens the box, and there's this amazing pin with two amethyst purple stones, and I said, I can't possibly accept this. And he said, my mother loved you, and we love you, and you have to accept this. And I said, well, it's a great honor. And so that pin, in many ways, and Katie's heart, is just shows that really inanimate objects can carry pretty powerful messages. And so, um, you know, those are some favorites. But I have to say, there, there's some fun pins there. But mostly, as people look at the exhibit, I just want them to remember that most of them are costume jewelry, and most of them are were delivering some message. Uh, and it got so that the other the other ambassadors or ministers knew what I was doing. Um, and uh, so they would look at them, and they would read my pins. Uh, so we had a lot of fun with that. So this book is a little different than your other book. When did you uh, decide that there was a book in this uh, subject? Well, um, what happened was that I, I had actually um, uh, written several others before. One of the things that uh, my, my former chief of staff, Elaine Shokas, is here, and she thought that we should really work on this book together, and uh, she has been the inspiration behind it. And I didn't want it to be my first book, because you know here I was, the first woman secretary of state writing about jewelry right off was not a great <laughs> idea. Um, so I wrote my memoirs, um, and then I wrote a book um, about the role of God in religion and foreign policy. Clyde Tuggle had a great role to play in that. I think that most people would not have put him at Yale Divinity, but uh, he uh, was there and he asked me to come and speak and it made me think about the role of God in religion and foreign policy. It has a great title. The title is The Mighty and the Almighty. Um, and um, I then wrote a book uh, that was about, uh, it was a memo to the president-elect. I had no idea who that person was going to be. Not so short. It was a little longer than, than my short memos. And so then I thought, well, okay, I can now write about the pins. And so that's how it happened. And now I've got a book in production, which is, uh, as I said, just so I never lie about my age, it was from 1937 when I was born until 1948 when we came to the United States. And I spent the war um, in England. My father was a Czechoslovak diplomat, and he was with the government in exile. Um, and so I tell that story. And some of the goes back to what we were talking about earlier, about the unintended consequences of decisions, how much information decision makers have, uh, what the role of the United States was or wasn't. So um, that will be out in the spring. Well, uh, I think you came here for the mighty and the almighty, and I think we had an overflow crowd in the yeah, chapel, yeah. which is a rarity, and I think we had an overflow chapel tonight, so I hope when the new book comes out, you'll consider us for a Very a happy stop. to. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Will you all come? I have to say that the exhibit here is remarkable. It's been a little bit different everywhere, and I think that it is displayed here brilliantly with maps, which I love, because one of the things I also wanted to do was to have people um, uh, be a little bit more knowledgeable about geography. Um, and when I was in office, I did a whole website about travels with the secretary, um, and I traveled a lot, um, a million thirty-eight thousand miles to be exact. Uh, but each secretary tries to beat that, so I think. <laughs> well, we have in the museum uh, an exhibit called Day in the Life of the President, which I think most people come out, they're sort of uh, almost in awe at how many things go on in one day. And when you go in and look at the map uh, that the uh, ambassador of the United Nations and Secretary of State, uh, the countries they visited, I think a person was just can't believe how big that yeah. is. 
Well, we're going to do a little transition here. Uh, we have mics set up, I believe, and people can line up, and we have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. Uh, we do ask people uh, that if you want to give a speech, uh, write a book, and we'll invite you to our <laughs> author's uh, <laughs> events. But uh, So we're looking for questions. and uh, it's We've got microphones over here, and over here we have two microphones in the uh, balcony as well. So if you just line up and we'll go from one to the other and recognizing. Jay, why don't we start over here? Good evening. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is working. Um, uh, first of all, what a terrific role model you have been for so many women and as the father of two daughters who are here tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my question is um, uh, everyone has a story. We're coming up on the anniversary of 9 11, and my family and I, we lived in New Jersey where. Uh, more than 20 people died that day, and I, I'd love to hear if you have a story, if you could talk about what, what was going on for you on 9-11, and uh, actually, if you're going to wear a special pin uh, for the 10-year uh, celebration, so, so thank you. Um, well, it, it's really um, been already quite a week as people talk about 9-11 and what it meant for them and uh, what lessons we ought to draw out of 9-11. Um, I, I have to say, for me, it was a very strange day because I was out of office. Um, and one of the things that had happened during the transition from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration, you brief on what is going on. And both Sandy Berger and I, um, I with Colin Powell and he with uh, Condoleezza Rice, explained that they were going to be spending a lot of time trying to deal with terrorism. Um, we made a big point of that. Um, and partially because of our own experiences with what had gone on. And I uh, loved being Secretary of State. Everybody who knows me knows that, except on August 7, 1998, when our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were blown up. And um, we knew that it had been done by Osama bin Laden. And because it was before 9-11, I think that in many ways people didn't understand why we were using cruise missiles to try to get Osama bin Laden. There was a lot of criticism of it. Thought we'd made it up. Uh, and so um, there were various aspects that happened as a result of that. We had to figure out how to fortify our embassy buildings. We had to move some of our embassies out of the center of town. And one of the things that I had to do, uh, very, very unpopular, was to put Jersey barriers around the State Department. So what happened was on the morning, um, I was sitting there and, and I got a phone call saying, you ought to watch television. So I was watching television, I saw the first tower be hit, and then I saw the second tower being hit. And um, it obviously, you knew right away that this was not some accident. So for reasons that are completely unclear to me, I decided I had to go to my office. I, I have a business, there was no reason to go to my office. And as I was driving there, I saw the smoke from the Pentagon. And then there was a news report that, in fact, there was some kind of truck or something by the State Department, and they thought that the State Department would be blown up. And I thought, thank God I had put those Jersey barriers around. I then, the office that I had at that stage had an amazing view of the Washington Monument. And we sat there all day watching to make sure that the Washington Monument was all right. So it was, it was there's no way to describe that day, but, but watching the, the buildings and, and then obviously the shock of people jumping out of the building, which seemed so unbelievable. And so I think it was like for everybody, and especially if you lived in New Jersey, just a stunning event. For me, um, the thing that makes me different from other Americans who are 74 years old is that I actually lived through World War II. And I would come in the morning out of an air raid shelter and see destroyed buildings. So I'd seen that. But for a, a born American, I think that it was so unbelievably significant because it showed the vulnerability of America, which as a Central European I had grown up with, but Americans thought we were safe behind two oceans. I think the lesson, though, is I know we have to go back and honor the dead and honor the moment. But I hope that we use this as a way to look forward and realize that what an amazing country America is and the resilience that we have, and that we're not going to go around being dominated by the fear factor and look at the person sitting next to us and try to figure out if they're a Muslim. 
um, and really try to understand that we're all in this together. And so I'm going back to Washington tonight because I have to participate in a series of 9-11 events tomorrow. But the real message to me is that we have to look forward and go back to what we think the Samara, what we're about, which is respect for each other and what it is that the people in the Arab Spring are talking about is dignity and respect for each other. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. And I have to say, it is all about the little girls. Uh, I have my youngest uh, granddaughter, um, and you were talking about the girls. She, when she turned seven, she said to her, which was two years ago, she said to her mother, so what's the big deal about Grandma Maddie being Secretary of State? Uh, only girls are Secretary of State. So in her lifetime. <laughs> Two questions. They're both brief questions, but I'll, I'll let you choose which one you want to answer. If you have time to answer both, great. Um, one's very practical, and it's um, I work have worked in the development community, and it's as a part of diplomacy that is uh, difficult for me to observe, and that is that each development agency pushes its own national contractors, and that I think creates a lot of um, difficult issues uh, on the ground. I just wanted to hear your perspective on that. And my second question has to do with the Arab Spring and Egypt in particular. Um, I, I've got a lot of friends in Egypt and they, you know, they're confident, you know, their voices were heard, but now they're really wondering if the new military, <laughs> are, are things really going to change? And I think a lot has changed, but I guess your perspective is particularly on Egypt. How do you prevent new regimes that might not be doing what the people want from coming into place. Thank you. Well, let me briefly answer both of them, actually. I think that the point about the development agencies and contractors is a huge issue. Partially, it's because the agencies themselves don't have the personnel to do the work, and so they do have to contract out. The problem is that uh, there's often a lot of um, overlapping or contradictions, and then we are reading terrible things about waste, fraud, and abuse, which undercuts the whole process. So I think that people are beginning to look at that very carefully, but you can't automatically say contractor bad. The bottom line is, is that um, there is no way that every development agency can send its own people out, and so there are experts in particular areas, but the way of trying not to have um, contradictory missions or for them to develop their own policies but to carry out the policies that they were sent there to do. On Egypt, I think that the issue, and this is true across the board here, is that um, it is very hard to, the street is, a, is an amazing aspect of this, and the social media that motivated people to go to Tahir Square, for instance. The problem is that the street can't govern the country. And the question is how you get the street into a governance procedure. I'm chairman of the board of a fabulous organization which works a lot with the Carter Center, the National Democratic Institute, that works in countries where we are invited to try to help develop the infrastructure for running countries. I happen to believe in political parties. They are the way that you get in, uh, the role, the voice of the people into governance, but you also need the rule of law. You have to make sure that they're not corrupt institutions. The problem that's there in Egypt is that the military is the only functioning thing that was left, and the question is what their role is, how much of a role they have in the economy, and trying to figure out when the right time to have an election is. Um, and also what was the issue is that the Muslim Brotherhood was outlawed by uh, Mubarak, and the truth is they're not a monolithic organization. They, however, are more organized than some of the other political uh, uh, entities. And so I think the Egyptians do need help, and they also need some, the, the military needs to have some pressure put on it in terms of um, how it behaves. And the two issues that you raise actually go together, because the question that a lot of development agencies have now is should they be giving money to the military uh, and is it being used right in order to help economic development, uh, or should it go to some private organizations? But the Arab Spring is a very complicated aspect. I said earlier that it's spread virally, but it's different in each of these countries, but it all has to do with what kind of political infrastructure 
can be developed. And it's a long story, and, and I usually get around to blaming the media. Uh, but what happened is I think the way it was covered, it was covered as a sports event. Uh, that um, you know, you were you picked your team, and and um, Anderson Cooper actually thought he was a rebel. Um, and uh, but the bottom line is, it's not a sports event. It's uh, and if it is a sports event, it's a marathon, and it's a very long story. And we can't have the media getting bored with it when it gets more complicated. Yeah. Okay, let's move to uh, this side, and then we'll come back over here. Yeah. Madam Secretary, thank you for being here. Uh, we hear a lot about the importance of public-private partnerships, and many people in this room are uh, involved with very consequential private organizations and companies. I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about um, public-private partnerships in the State Department um, under your leadership and what you think the proper role is for that relationship and that balance? Well, it's very interesting because I learned a lot about public-private partnerships when I was Secretary of State, and I know it always terrifies people to think that you actually learn something when you already have the job. Um, <laughs> but what was interesting was that I began to meet with um, CEOs when I was Secretary, and. Uh, part of the issue was that some of them said, well, we don't understand what role the government has. How can the government help us? And I said, well, actually, um, you need the government um, when you want to enter a new market and trying to deal with the regulatory issues. And there is a partnership that way. Then what would happen is that I would go somewhere, and I was always asked to speak to AmCham, the American Chamber Abroad, and I'd give speeches and I would learn nothing. And I thought, well, I need to talk to the representatives of American corporations abroad to find out what they knew. Because in many ways, uh, the people that work on, on the ground in, <clears throat> in the countries representing American <clears throat> companies are, have a, a whole different view of what's going on from what maybe some diplomats have and, and an experience in dealing in that country in real time. And many, I would say, that every American company has a better health and labor policy than uh, companies that are in some places local. So I, I began to see American corporations as very much part of kind of being ambassadors. And what we began to do at the State Department when I was there was to give a prize to American corporations that were good local citizens. Um, that really, because in order to operate abroad, I thought that it was important for companies to be very local. Um, as Coca-Cola is co-sponsoring this, they're an amazing local company. They have to be. They use water. Uh, and they have local bottlers. And so for them, it's a good, good advantage, in fact, to, to be good local partners. So I learned a lot when I was secretary. Now I'm on the outside, and I, am, I have a business, and I represent a non-governmental organization. And also, what I recently um, learned was, it's not a, a secret, you know what trouble the budgets are in. And the, uh, one of the departments that has a huge budget problem is the State Department. The Pentagon has something like, I don't know what the most recent number is, like $700 billion that they're requesting. The State Department is requesting somewhere between 50 and $60 billion, big difference. Um, and so the question is how you can give more strength to the State Department, and the public-private partnerships are very much a part of it. And what has happened is actually Secretary Clinton has asked me to chair an organization called Partners for a New Beginning, based off of President Obama's Cairo speech about how to develop a different relationship with um, um, Muslim-majority communities. And it's a public-private partnership. I'm the chairman of it. Mukhtar Khan of Coca-Cola is a vice chair. And the Aspen Institute is another vice chair. And then we have a steering committee made up of American CEOs and also heads, presidents of universities and non-governmental organizations and then local partners in all these countries that um, we have set up. We have a great one in Turkey. Uh, we are working in Egypt, in Indonesia. Uh, we're working on all of this. <clears throat> and it's the, it, for me, again, it's a way of, of um, improving our reach and seeing the value of public-private partnerships. I think they're absolutely essential. Our, our country is based on having strong private sector um, in my view, working closely in many ways with the public sector, and it really is a great um, innovation. Thanks for asking that. Thank you very much. Over here. Hello, 
thank you for being here. This has been great. Can you hear me? All right. Yep. Okay. My name is Valerie Haskins. I'm a teacher, and right now I'm homeschooling, and I'm homeschooling Genevieve, and this has been a learning experience. We love the, um, the pens. It's great. been a great thing. But Genevieve has a question to ask. Um, how many uh, uh, animal pens do you have? <laughs> I really don't know. I have a lot of animal pins, though. I have, well, I have some nice animal pins, uh, like polar bears, and, um, and I have some dogs and cats. Then I have some really nasty bugs and things. Um, I have a lot of fish uh, and crabs. Uh, and um, I have turtles. And they all have a different use. Um, I have eagle pins, um, and um, but doves I wear when I was talking about peace. I have a lot of pins about the Middle East peace process, mostly turtles, uh, sometimes crabs. <laughs> uh, um, so um, I love the animal pins, and, and some of the more famous ones are the bugs. And I have to tell one bug story, which is that the Believe it or not, after the end of the Cold War, the Russians were bugging the State Department. Um, and uh, there was a conference room close to my office, and we discovered that they had put a, a listening device, a bug, in there. And there was a man sitting outside listening to everything that we did, and we finally figured it out. And we did the diplomatic thing, which was you send a demarche, and you say, stop doing that. And uh, so, but then when I met with the Russian foreign minister, I wore this huge bug, and he knew exactly uh, what I was talking about. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. Madam Secretary, thank you very much. My question is more to do with the role of women and leadership in the context of future leaders. Um, how, how do you perceive uh, youth and young voice when it comes to not just policy making, but just driving more collaboration amongst, uh, not, with, not, within, not just within the United States, but just globally. And I would love to hear your comments on that. Well, I think a couple of different things. Demographically, <clears throat> there, the Arab Spring, in many ways, was a youth movement, a youth bulge. What is happening in many countries is the generation between 18 and 25 is the largest one, many of them unemployed. Uh, many of them educated and unemployed, some ed uneducated and unemployed, but basically it is very much the demographic. Also, in every country, women are the majority of the population, not that women have the majority of the jobs or are paid well. But the bottom line is, is that youth and women are um, the, the uh, trend of the future in most of the countries that are in some form of upheaval and need to be very much a part of it. I mentioned that I was chairman of the National Democratic Institute. We have a whole program um, in which we support women candidates, win with women. And uh, we believe that, in fact, societies are more stable when women are politically and economically empowered. Um, and that um, a series of issues that are whether it's um, spread of sexual disease or education and a variety of issues are taken more seriously. Um, and so there, I think it is very important to move forward with that. Now, I happen to, I, I do think that more women need to be in high level positions, but I am not for a world that is fully run only by women. Anybody who thinks that has forgotten high school. And so uh, it is very important to have societies in which men and women uh, work together, whose talents are fully respected. Uh, but women's voices have to be heard, and the youth has to, has to be very much involved. This Partners for a New Beginning that I was talking about, we have four vertical pillars that we work on, which is economic empowerment, education, science and technology, and people-to-people -people exchanges. The horizontal aspect of it is to get women and youth involved in all these issues. But I think it is very important to have your voice heard. Thank you. You've met with a lot of uh, famous and powerful people. And in fact, in your book, you have some pictures of yourself with some of the people that America most loves to hate. Uh, how, how do you find a way, human to human, 
to connect with those people, and I know you're known as a, as a wonderful communicator. How do you find a way to deal with those people, human to human? Do you look for something good in, in, in each person that you meet with? You mentioned respect. How do you handle that? Well, I, I think I always preferred to meet with people that I liked, but um, <laughs> you, you actually do have to meet with a lot of different people when you are responsible for the foreign policy of your country. And I think that what makes a good negotiator is to try to put yourself into the other person's shoes. It's absolutely essential to try to do that. Um, and otherwise, you can't understand what the issue is about. And so um, uh, I think that you do have to figure out um, what that person is about, why they're doing what they're doing, uh, and try to find the areas where you can find something to talk about. The important point, though, I think, is what I think is really hard, especially for an American, is how not to smile when you meet somebody, even if you can't stand them. But the person that I found the hardest to deal with was Milosevic. Uh, I knew what he was doing. Uh, we had talked about Bosnia. Uh, and I had a meeting with him, and he was trying to charm me, and he was telling me about the history of the Serbs, and, and I have, uh, life is full of peculiar accidents, but my father was ambassador to Yugoslavia. Um, and so I happened to understand Serbian, and I know their history. And so he kept going on, and I finally said, I happen to know what your history is, and uh, ethnic cleansing is not part of it, and you know I, we went through that. And part of it was also, I did not want to have my picture taken with him. So what happened was I got ambushed by the photographers, and a picture in the book is me just looking grim and awful. But the bottom line is you try, you smile when you talk to somebody, and so all of a sudden you have pictures of yourself when um, people who don't like you are trying to say that you had terrible policy. I was in North Korea, and I'm there, and uh, Kim Jong-il is toasting me. You know, it's a little hard to say, I'm not toasting with you. I'm here to talk to you about your nuclear program. Uh, but there, you are pictured with people that you don't like. What I would do, though, is I think it's also very important, is you have a message to deliver. There's no point in just going and being, um, you know, not saying what's on your mind. And so we would go through some niceties, and then I would say, I have come a long way, so I must be frank. And then I'd let him have it. So I think that you have to say what you believe, uh, and you have to try to put yourself in the other person's shoes, but you have to remember what your job is to try to, to get some change and to make very clear what the issue is. Because if you don't, then you can't figure out how to come to some kind of an agreement. You brought up the topic that um, I was going to ask you about. Uh, I will, you obviously played a major role in dealing with North Korea. and. Uh, it's, it seems almost easy to become pessimistic uh, to think about the role of diplomacy, what, what diplomacy can do in dealing with that country because it seems like that uh, North Korea is just about playing everybody, uh, playing against the entire world. So what do you think is going to be the role of uh, U.S. and also the par uh, partnership between the government and non-governmental organizations in dealing with uh, North Korea and solving the human rights crisis there? Well, I think North Korea is one of the, uh, the people of North Korea are suffering unjustly, obviously, under a terrible dictator. And I hold no brief for Kim Jong-il. Uh, but what was interesting, and I'll just tell the story a little bit of what happened, was that um, Kim Dae-jung, the president of South Korea, had gone to North Korea and had come back and said that it was possible to talk with Kim Jong-il. What was interesting, President Carter had gone earlier, talked to Kim Il-sung, and um, had a lot of messages about what could happen in North Korea. So what happened was that um, the number two man, uh, Vice Marshal Cho, came to the United States in order to invite President Clinton to go to North Korea. And um, so President Clinton said, well, I might go at some point, but I'm not just going to show up. I have to have the Secretary of State go first. That didn't make him real happy. Um, and we had no ambassador in North Korea, so we had no idea what to expect. But I have to tell you this, that my meeting with Kim Jong-il, um, we had been told our intelligence said that he was crazy and a pervert. He's not crazy. 
And so the bottom line is that um, uh, I had no idea whether he would see me or not. Uh, and uh, he wouldn't see me until I went to see his embalmed father. And then uh, we had our first meeting, and we're, uh, we had a press conference. And, and you'll see a picture of this, by the way. Is, uh, and we're standing there, and I see that we're about the same height. And I know that I had on high heels, and then I looked over, and he did too. And uh, his hair was a lot poofier than mine. And, but what we did was have about 12 hours of really serious talks. And we were in the middle of negotiations when um, the Clinton administration ended. And while I hold no brief for Kim Jong-il, there were many people that were confused by the election of 2000 in the United States. There clearly were people one can understand why the North Koreans might be confused. And uh, some of the faults that I hold the Bush administration to is that they did not pick up the hand of cards that we left in North Korea. So the North Korean situation has deteriorated in many ways. Um, at the moment, the North Koreans, again, are, are beginning to think that they have to talk. Kim Jong-il went and talked to Medvedev in Russia. We are hoping that the Chinese will have some role, but it's a dangerous place. And they have, in fact, sold or transmitted some of their nuclear technology to other countries. The people are eating bark off the trees. Uh, the United States has shown goodwill by providing some food through the World Food Program. Um, and I think we just have to keep pushing, because ultimately, there are enough people that are, are showing that they want to have some sense of freedom in North Korea, and the South Koreans are now looking at a policy of trying to figure out how to deal with them better. But it is a tragedy for the North Korean people and the United States. What they want is recognition by the United States. And so the question is, at what stage one does that? Uh, the problem that has happened is that the North Koreans, in many ways, are making us at least the people that disagree that we should be doing anything with North Korea, they keep saying we said that we have sold the or they have given us the same horse over and over again that we don't move forward. But it has to move forward at some point. Okay, uh, we'll have two more questions: one in the balcony, and then uh, yeah, over right. here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, I was wondering um, if in terms of your discussion on prote protecting the American value of democracy abroad and intervening in times of genocide um, and ethnic cleansing, if maybe you could discuss the marked difference between U.S. policy in Bosnia compared to that of Rwanda. Yes. Uh, um, I think that one of the aspects of this, and, and I have spent a lot of time on this issue for any number of different reasons, is that one has to understand from the perspective of a decision maker, what you know and when you know it, and what are the other, um, what's the context for what is going on. You, to go back to initial question you asked about uh, intervention generally, um, what you have to remember is that after the Gulf War, as I said earlier, many Americans were not interested in um, going abroad and doing things abroad. There was kind of a sense that after um, many years of, of a different administration that, in fact, we needed to worry about ourselves a little bit more. So in terms of looking at where we would act when, it was really going against the tide, very difficult. Um, I, I talked about how hard it was to do Bosnia. We also, um, the Bush administration had begun uh, what was a humanitarian operation in Somalia that then turned into fighting, and if you remember, um, we lost um, Black Hawk down and uh, American troops being dragged through the streets and people were appalled. I was at the UN. I had to constantly keep ex trying to explain what we were doing um, and people wondering what the US, why were we in there at all. Then also there were problems in Haiti um, and um, we had sent an aircraft carrier there, the, uh, Harlan County that had to turn around, and there was just a mood in terms of what are you people doing getting involved everywhere. The thing about Rwanda that is very difficult for people to understand is that there was a lot of information that came later about Rwanda. At the time that decisions were being made about Rwanda, we didn't know everything that is out in the news now about Rwanda. Um, I find it one of the 
um, hardest things to explain to anybody. I was at, at the UN at the time. My instructions were to vote against whatever expansion of the Rwanda mission was. I hated my instructions. I got up from the table, went and called Washington and said, I don't want to do it this way, change my instructions, and I didn't get a change in the instructions. What has happened, though, is that President Clinton has, uh, he asked us all to try to figure out what had really happened. He has said it was a disaster that we didn't do anything. I feel that way, but the bottom line that one has to remember is that we were overextended in a number of areas and we did not have the information that people had afterwards. So that's the difference. Should we have done something? Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about it. But at the time, we did not have the information. And the hard part, and I do this when I teach, is decision making is very interesting to study. There is nothing easier than doing hindsight on decision making. The decision makers, however, operate with a limited amount of information uh, and have to make decisions. And, um, and I think that's the hardest part in going back and looking at history as to why decisions were made the way they are, but it makes me understand a little bit more how hard those decisions are when you don't have all the information. And now, as I told you, I was writing this book, and I'm going back over a part of history that I thought I understood well. If you look at the papers of what people were thinking and doing at the time, you get a better understanding of it. But it, it's a, it's a, I say it, that Rwanda weighs very heavy on my soul, and it certainly does on President Clinton's, but that's the explanation for it. Final question. Okay. Um, I've been involved with African affairs for many years. I was a delegate to the National Summit on Africa under the Clinton administration. I would like to know what you think was the most significant um, policy development or initiative relating to Africa under the Clinton administration. Under the Clinton administration? I think that um, there were, first of all, a lot more attention was paid to Africa and we actually knew that it was more than one place. Uh, and. Um, Many of us, I went to Africa many times, Susan Rice, who at that stage was the Assistant Secretary for Africa. Uh, we did a number of um, initiatives in terms of what was happening, um, specifically in countries, whether it was Liberia, uh, tried to make some changes in Nigeria, worked very hard on a number of different issues. But in many ways, one of the things that I thought was going to make a huge difference was um, the Trade Act that um, there was a way that we thought that we should liberalize trade with Africa. It turned out to be a real problem, primarily, I happen to believe in trade, but the problem is that there are a lot of issues in terms of what goods can be let in or not. And so I thought AGOA is what it was not called, was a, a great initiative. Did it really work? Not as well as I think we all wanted it to. But what we thought we were doing was beginning to recognize the stature and status of a variety of African countries that made us realize the differences there, what had to be done to support democracy, to try to get away, try to help in fighting corruption. It's all very hard. I mean, I, I spent time, I, I went to the Democratic Republic of Congo, a misnomer, uh, and sp stood there with then President Kabila, uh, when I began to ask about what kind of democracy movements were taking place, he cut off, he ended the press conference. Um, and so there were a number of things that we were working on, and I, but, um, and I think probably paid more attention to Africa than most administrations. And so, um, I, but I think it was a matter of, try, of seeing what the differences were, uh, the amount of time that we spent on sub-Saharan Africa, um, and um, trying to sort out how to have respect for the leadership and work on some of the trade issues. But Rwanda played a huge role in what we didn't do and therefore what happened in Congo um, and the various issues that we had to deal with there. Uh, let me wrap up by uh, thanking all of you for coming. Uh, it's great to see our terrific counselor corps here. We have in Atlanta, we think the best counselor corps in the country. Uh, again, it's a great privilege to see Mrs. Carter here tonight. I'd uh, also like to mention Kwanzaa Hall, who is the uh, councilman for this area, if you wave. 
Uh, he's very important. He's the only local official, I believe, in the world who has two Nobel Peace Prizes in his district. Um, <laughs> I, I may also need to call him tomorrow because uh, I have never seen this many people in the uh, room and uh, if the fire marshal gets on my case, I may need some help. <laughs> uh, but most of all, we want to thank Secretary Albright. I think you'll all agree that she left us with a... Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much for... Um, your terrific questions, and Mrs. Carter, thank you very much for coming, and please give my love to the President, and uh, thank you all, and I hope you like the show.